So basically, I'm going to tell you about uh, some work um, I did with uh, various uh, collaborators actually in the past two years. And uh, so we started out with this paper with Livia Ferro, to uh, Tomek Vukovsky, Carlo Manigelli, Jan Plevka, uh, where we introduced uh, a spectral parameter into the scattering problem. Um, I'll explain you the original motivation in a second. Uh, and these are later follow-up papers on the same subject. And uh, I feel we, after two years, we're finally starting to understand the problem and sort of uh, managed to, in some sense, summarize the two years of work in a single formula, condense it in a single formula. Uh, and I feel that this single formula might be useful for, for people who like amplitudes but don't want to learn all of integrability to, to jump in. Um, so there was also related work uh, by Titterin, Derkatrov, and Kirchner in those two papers, uh, and also by Niklas and Johannes Brödel and Matteo Rosso, and Johannes Brödel, Marius Delev, and Matteo Rosso. Okay, so uh, I'll tell you our motivation. Uh, uh, so, of course, uh, uh, amplitude got a big boost. Uh, uh, when, um, starting with the paper I written in 2003, uh, uh, people remembered uh, this beautiful uh, way to uh, use uh, <coughs> so-called uh, spinner helicity variables uh, to um, describe massless scattering. And my point here, and that was really the original motivation, is that this only works in exactly one plus three <coughs> dimensions. Um, so uh, then, uh, as you'll see in a second, uh, it's very useful to write, write things nicely at tree level. Uh, but then at loop level, one gets these divergences, infrared divergences, and, uh, and, and then the, the canonical way is uh, people go a bit out of 1 plus 3 to regulate, and, uh, and then you destroy all of this beautiful structure. And we thought that that, that, can't, that, that, that can't work. We should, uh, we, we should not leave 1 plus 3 dimensions. So, and what's so special here, I mean, you have this wonderful uh, bijection between a four-vector uh, in Minkowski space and uh, Hermitian, general Hermitian 2 by 2 matrices. And then for massless car particles, the p squared of the momentum uh, is just the determinant of this matrix, which vanishes. Therefore, it must be of at most rank 1. And you can factor uh, this Hermitian matrix into these uh, spinners, <coughs> uh, variables lambda alpha, lambda tilde alpha dot. So that's well-known stuff. Uh, and then. Uh, uh, you can um, you can rewrite uh, the arbitrary uh, tree-level scattering amplitudes in, in a very nice way. Uh, so uh, the total momentum becomes now a matrix, two by two matrix, uh, given as a sum over uh, the spinner helicity variables on the n legs. Uh, you 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 introduce some superpartners, these Grassmann uh, spinners, uh, eta. Uh, and um, then the so-called MHV amplitude is given by just this uh, very nice expression. And it was understood by Drummond and Han how to uh, proceed to a general uh, helicity or super helicity configurations. Uh, you get these rational functions, uh, which uh, we know how to compute uh, recursively. In fact, uh, uh, all external helicity uh, configurations are generated by expansion in these Grassmann variables. And super helicity decay corresponds to terms eta to the 4k. Um, now, then uh, some people in the room uh, um, reformulated this problem in a, in a way that looks completely different. Completely different. So, a uh, switch of topic. Basically, we talk about Grassmannian spaces. Uh, what is this? Uh, uh, that's a set a generalization of projective space, you take uh, uh, k planes or k subvector spaces uh, um, in an n-dimensional space. And uh, being subvector space, it got, should go to the zero. Uh, uh, and, um, and you say each such plane is a point on a Grassmannian manifold. You can show that that uh, is uh, for real or complex vector spaces is actually a manifold. Uh, and, and these are the points of the manifold. And now, uh, uh, a particular nice way to do things is to, to work uh, with twisters and actually super twisters, which you get formally uh, by uh, um, 
by a so-called half Fourier transform of the lambda into some eta tildes, and you form this uh, super twister uh, W, which transforms uh, linearly under GL4 slash 4. And then uh, this expression here uh, basically gets reformulated into something that looks completely different as a as a just the integration over this Grassmannian space. You integrate over all points. Now it's clear that on this k plane you can choose an arbitrary basis, so you have a GLK invariance, uh, which you should mod out because you want to count every point in the space on, uh, with, with, with weight 1. Uh, uh, you have a delta function which encodes the external kinematics. So um, uh, C, the, the points are k by n matrices, and you just dot these uh, external data, uh, uh, which is coded into these Ws uh, from the right into this matrix. Yeah? And then the weight uh, down here is just uh, all the cyclic k by k matri uh, minors of this k by n matrix. And you take only the cyclic minors. Um, now, uh, in order to get really this formula, you should, uh, uh, for MHV, you just saturate the delta function until you are done. For non-MHV, uh, you have to say a bit more. You have to choose the right quanters to, 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 to get it. <laughs> uh, in fact, uh, uh, the way in the end you don't, uh, in the way of doing this here, you, you, you never actually compute an integral because this is a rational function after you set, saturate the delta function. So you just u use the residue theorem. But for that, you have to choose the right contours. OK? And uh, now, uh, actually, for most points on this uh, Grassmannian, uh, GRKN, uh, you can use some uh, special coordinates. For example, put a one uh, uh, k by k unit matrix here. And then uh, things simplify a bit. And if you now look at this uh, delta functions here, you've put one here in front of the first uh, kw's. And that's a nice way to actually derive the original formula. You do this uh, now. Uh, you're ready to do the, uh, this half Fourier transform to spin helicity space. And then you actually show that you get um, the original amplitude uh, in spin helicity space. OK. Let's talk a bit about the symmetries of this wonderful contour integrals uh, and, and, and therefore the amplitudes, uh, uh, or rather the amplitudes and therefore <laughs> So it's, a, it's a beautiful integral. So the amplitudes enjoy an n equals 4 superconformal symmetry. That's PSU224. Uh, the P is related to the, super tra uh, to the trace, and the S is related to the supertrace. So the supertrace should, uh, uh, you should take, uh, it's not part of the symmetry. It's actually not zero. It's not a symmetry. And the P is, uh, you impose, that's a, uh, related to the central charge. Uh, and uh, th then uh, you can show that the amplitudes, and actually you can directly show it for the integral, uh, um, the, uh, are symmetries. I mean, these are symmetries for the amplitudes. Um, and actually, as shown by Dramantan and Plefka, if you commute J and J tilde, one obta obtains so-called Youngian symmetry. We'll talk a bit uh, more about this. So, so basically, uh, you take the generators, you have to take out the supertrace, as I said, and then uh, if you uh, these young and generators which you get from this commutation uh, are uh, these J hats, and they are bilinear, uh, bi local in, uh, along the, uh, this chain of, of particle scattering. Yeah? In fact, this is how integrability first appeared in the planar scattering problem. And it was just an observation at this point, and it was not actually really useful, it was just an observation. Now, um, actually, these, these contour integrals are amazing because, for example, you can show many, many things. So you can immediately show, uh, expose this uh, dual symmetry um, by a clever change of variables. Uh, that was um, done in a little bit later paper by Nima et al. And uh, basically, uh, you, you change, uh, use a different gauge uh, choice on, and, and do some, uh, uh, basically, some linear algebra manipulations. And then you can give a dual form, a dual in, in, um, uh, um, Grassmannian integral, where this uh, nice um, MHV part just sort of factors out. And you have a little bit smaller uh, integral over a slightly smaller Grassmannian, where the k gets shifted down to k hat equals k minus 2. Okay? And, uh, and then you can show that actually now the data is encoded in super momentum twisters. Uh, so now the data sits into this C dot Z. 
Um, and, 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 and that's a way to show dual super conformal symmetry uh, for, uh, on this Grassmannian level. It's, it's just wonderful. Um, now, uh, now I come back to what, what we did two years ago. And as I said, first we didn't quite understand it. Now we understood it much better. And I can say, tell you in a nutshell what we did. So basically, um, we, should we should really look at this, uh, took a look at PSL 4 slash 4 and look at the trace, so the central charge generator. If you express it back in spin helicity variables, you see that this is what one should call super helicity. It's basically the helicity uh, plus a number operator of the fermions. Okay. And now of, uh, for the amplitude to be uh, a symmetry of PGL 4 slash 4, um, you just need the overall uh, central charge to be zero. So on the algebraic level, and if you don't care about global issues, you can just uh, imagine relaxing the local con condition that the central charges at each leg should be zero. And then from this formula, you see that the physical interpretation of this mathematical uh, um, um, manipulation is um, a deformation of the helic helicities. Um, and uh, maybe it's not so bad because actually on the algebraic level everything works very well and uh, usually the helicity get quantized for uh, just uh, for if you look at the global symmetry because you want it to be uh, uh, integrable up to the group. Yeah? Okay, now if you go back to this Youngian uh, uh, algebra, this is actually something very well known, uh, s uh, studied by mathematicians a lot. Uh, this Youngian also allows for a uh, deformation, and uh, you can actually express it in so-called evaluation representation. And basically what happens is that, that the, the j's are un, uh, unchanged and the j hats, apart from this bilocal term, they get another uh, linear piece. But uh, it's basically not just j, which would be boring, uh, but it's like uh, you can really locally uh, impose <coughs> on, on the next level, on the j hat level, uh, the uh, PSU uh, invariance with some arbitrary complex numbers vj. And uh, actually, well, uh, the point is, if you switch on the central charges at each leg, you switch on these deformations on the Youngian. Now, that means that uh, since we have this wonderful contour integral, there should be a very, very simple way to say what this deformation is on the level of these contour integrals. And in fact, there is. Um, you can just deform them. And uh, in fact, what you do is, uh, you introduce this uh, 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 speckle parameters v plus minus, which are v plus minus central charge over two. That's something uh, which people who worked on spin chains and the speckle problem and so on know very well. This is uh, some standard thing uh, from integrability. These kind of combinations appear all the time in spin chains and so on. Um, and uh, if you require, so now the point is that this uh, integral here actually just deforms in the following way. These, all these minors pick up certain powers. And in fact, uh, in principle, it's any powers, but they have an interpretation. And the interpretation I wrote you. So if you look carefully at these uh, deformations, this really is a V. So here for the first one, 1 to k, it's Vk plus minus V1 minus. So last minus first, last plus minus first minus. And then it goes through cyclically. In fact, if you look at the, uh, this December 2012 paper of Nima, there was a discussion that this could be, in principle, some possible modification of the measure. But uh, then they really always wanted uh, to have logarithmic uh, terms, dc over c. So then, of course, it's discarded. But if you, if you don't demand that, uh, you, you get that. Okay? And now, since this completely pr uh, preserves integrability and therefore dual conformal invariance and everything, you should be able to do this uh, uh, change of variables uh, I talked about. And in fact, it runs through very smoothly. And what you get is now a deformed MHV piece times a smaller deformed Grassmannian integral. And actually, you should a little look, I don't have time now, you should a lo look a little bit at the details. Actually, these powers are a little bit different. Now it's a little bit shorter minus, and now it's, uh, it's a V plus, which sits to the, a bit to the right of the minor, minus the V minus, which sits a little bit to the left. And here it's just pairwise interactions in this thing. So you, uh, you, you should look at it. It's very intricate, this formula. It's very nice. Uh, and actually, to God, what I forgot to say here is, you seem to now have uh, two end parameters, deformation parameters, because you have a V plus and a V minus at each leg. But actually, you don't, because there is a constraint for, if you really want Young and invariance, you need to have, in general, that um, basically 
the V plus are a permutation of the V minus. But actually, for this, uh, for this uh, Grassmannian integral, which um, is related to cyclic permutation, it should be just the cyclic shift by k. So you need to impose this, and then you have n parameters left, n deformation. But actually, if you look carefully, you see it only depends on differences, so it's actually n minus 1. There's the overall mode uh, uh, which, uh, which, uh, which drops out. Okay? And uh, now you can uh, just see that it's just as well also GLK invariant as before. Um, so uh, this is very, very, very natural from a mathematical point of view. OK, now still, it's, it's math. And why would, why would we want to do this? Um, well, um, here are some reasons. Uh, I'll show you now a bit. I'll sketch you the derivation of these formulas. Uh, and, uh, and you will see it's just from the point of view of integrability. It's really, I mean, something I already said, because this deformation of the Youngin is, is, uh, is very natural. Uh, but um, one can even argue that if you want to properly define, uh, construct these amplitudes from integrability, you actually need it. Even though in integrability, you kind of need it as a, as a regulator, uh, I, I, I will argue. And, um, now, uh, also another argument that the amplitudes are related uh, to the spectral problem, as we know. And in the spectral problem, exact, uh, in the exact solution, it's absolutely indispensable. That was our original uh, motivation. We really wanted to have the spectral parameter also into the amplitude game. And in fact, uh, I still continue to believe that this pro uh, promises to provide a very natural infrared regulator. Either directly, or at least it should, it should guide you, like it should help you to, to take out the, the divergent stuff as, as a prefactor. So um, that is, uh, that's the, the, so the promise behind it. And in fact, uh, we, 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 I went to some workshop last uh, December in Simons and talked to Andrew Hodges. And, and uh, actually, he gave an interesting talk. It seems like uh, Penrose and Hodges also looked at these deformations in the very early days of, uh, of uh, twisters. And, uh, and introduced them and showed they didn't do loops, but they showed that uh, if you, at tree level, glue in certain wave functions, I mean, you, you act with the amplitude on a certain wave function, uh, you also get something like uh, an infrared divergence, uh, and, you, and that definitely gets regulated. So, so that's independent evidence that this regularization idea works. OK, now, on the other hand, of course, what's the main criticism? It seems like. Life was so beautiful before, yeah? You just had this, uh, in fact, there's, um, if, if you read the Nima's paper, you think you never have to do any integral because it's, like, it's just, uh, that's, you know, like you don't do them. You just look at the poles and then, and, then, and, then, and then you are done, okay? So here, unfortunately, you will have to do some integrals. Uh, why? Because you have really lost meromorphicity now. Uh, it's no longer a rational function. In fact, in this, uh, on the Grassmannian, uh, you, you, you really have now cuts. And where you had a pole, you have a branch point suddenly. Yeah? And then the, and the branch points, they are given by the problem. They are God-given. And now, of course, the cut, you have some choice. It's man-made. But, uh, but the branch points are there. And in particular, this means, and that's very important for what follows, is you can no longer use a BCFW recursion relation because they are completely uh, based, on, um, uh, based on the residue theorem. So, 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 so that sounds very bad. You can use it, at least not in the way it has always been used. Um, uh, but, but at the same time, what you possibly gain here is uh, um, that you get meromorphicity in the speckle parameters. You see these speckle parameters um, in, uh, in S matrix series integral models, they are always cut free. They're just, uh, they're in integral model, you only, have, uh, you only have elastic scattering, so you only have poles. So um, if you do things correctly, the, the hope is that you get complete meromorphicity in the speckle parameter. And that should help you to define your contours. So then it would not be something you have to put in from you. you it's, then it wouldn't be something you have to put in from some external principle or some, uh, some outside extra data or something. It would be just given again by, by, by the mathematics of the problem. Just meromorphicity would fix the contours. So that's the idea. Now, um, I just, uh, I will not today really go into the details how to do this for the amplitudes. And in fact, we are still working on this. But uh, just to give a little toy, make a little toy meromorphicity experiment, uh, if you look at the beta function, Euler's uh, first integral, uh, it looks a bit similar to these Grassmannian integrals, uh, right? And we know the result. Uh, uh, 
so the v's are like the spectral parameter gamma v1 gamma v2 over gamma v1 plus v2 and of course this integral representation only works uh, if the real parts of v1 and v2 are positive um, but then if you look at the result you know that this is a meromorphic function those are has poles but you don't see it from this integral representation so then um, some smart guy in the 90s it was actually the 1890s not the 1990s <laughs> uh, he uh, he figured out uh, how to how to how to see that. I mean, he, he just uh, said, "Okay, let me let me expose this property, similar to like you you you, you these counter integrals are very smart. If you if you write them right, way, you see everything. You don't have to do any calculation anymore. So so basically, um, he showed that with some very weird contour uh, uh, given down here. The picture you can find on Wikipedia is a Pochhammer contour. You have taken out basically." these poles here from the gamma v1, gamma v2 as a prefactor. Yeah, it's just they sit in front and you have a sort of a reduced contour integral which is completely finite, completely finite. And you can put any value for v1 and v2. And the price you pay is, uh, of course, you have a little bit comp complete contour and it actually goes through the cut. So you shouldn't be, the other message, you shouldn't be afraid of going through the cuts. In fact, it's very easy to sit in amplitudes. You cannot do it with just surrounding cuts or something. That, 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 that doesn't work. You have to go through. Okay. So, um, so that's a fantasy, and that's, it's, it's admittedly only a toy, but the ideas can we sort of factor out all the divergences in, in this way. That, that's a goal, okay? Anyway, uh, now uh, let me give you a little bit more technology how you derive these, uh, these uh, formulas, even though maybe you don't need to know that. I mean, uh, you can just start playing with these integrals, I think, but uh, still it's good to know where it comes from, okay? So where does it come from? Um, well, basically, you use some uh, uh, spin chain technology. Uh, and uh, you, in spin chain, everything is always based on some so-called so Lux operator and these monodromies. So you can think of these monodromies, these uh, vertical lines, lines are like the scattered particles in, 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 in the scattering problem. And this dashed line is some uh, uh, auxiliary line. It's just uh, for n slash m and n plus n plus n plus. So for GLN, it's an n times n matrix. It's a table of the generators, basically. So, so the test line is, is, is the symmetry generators, and the horizontal line is, uh, uh, is the thing you are, you're looking at, the, the scattering amplitude. OK? And, uh, and then you can actually very nicely, from this monotony, uh, express Young invariance in the following way. You, 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 you take this monotony and expand it at speckle parameter equals infinity. And you find 1. At 1 over u, you find the the, the symmetry, ordinary symmetry, and one of u squared, you find the Young in symmetry. And then you get higher stuff, which is related to so called Serre relations, but that usually is taken care of then. Uh, and then you can just, uh, uh, in a spin chain way, encode Young in invariance by just saying, uh, like a group, M is like a group like thing, M on the amplitude is 1. That's all. M on the amplitude is 1. And that's Young in invariance. Okay? Uh, so then, uh, it becomes sort of a spin chain problem. In spin chains, we would take the trace over M, that's called the transfer matrix, and we would try to find the eigenvalues of the transfer matrix. Here's a bit different. Uh, here's a little bit different problem. It's actually sort of N times N eigenvalue problems, and you want the eigenvalue to be 1 or 0, yeah, because there's a delta AP. Yeah, so you prescribe the eigenvalue and, um, and, and then solve for psi, and you have to choose your monodromy properly, and that's related to choosing these Speckle parameters, and when I said before that this natural from integrability, these, these speckle parameters that sit in these legs, and each leg has one, and young bucks they satisfy no matter how to what value you choose these, uh, put these values. So it's very natural. And actually, in people in spin chains who compute correlations functions, they, for spin chains now, they really need these uh, parameters, otherwise, way too singular to compute any correlation function on the spin chain. Okay, so um, yeah, so there's a nice graphical way. You just pull through this test line, and that's this equation here. Okay, now you could do some beta on that. We did this in this paper, and uh, I'll be brief on this uh, uh, because it's like a spin chain problem. You can do some beta on that, and you, in the end of the day, you find some very strange two point invariant, which I guess uh, is just some propagator, z particle going to a w particle or something like this. Uh, and then if you look at three point, if you solve it for three sides, you immediately find these Hodges vertices, but the deformed ones. 
Yeah? And if you do it for GLN, you find some GLN version. If you do it for Fortlash 4, you find exactly the correct Hodges versus for, the, for PSU224. OK? Now, uh, yeah, so, so that's that. Now, what's very nice is, from the Spete ansatz, what you find is that certain Baxter polynomial, that you find a certain Baxter polynomial. And you find the beta equation in the end tells you that the Baxter polyno polynomial where the zeros are the v plus should be the, the Baxter polynomial where the zeros are the v minus. Now, what does this mean? We, that means that the v plus have to be a permutation of the mi v minus. And that's the thing we said before from young invariants. So you see it, it just pops out from the beta ansatz here uh, in a very unexpected way. I mean, you, you get this condition for young invariants here. OK. And then I, now I'm already running out of time. So I actually, um, basically, this Hodges variant, you, you should read uh, Nima et al.'s paper. Uh, you know, Yaroslav et al.'s paper, uh, you, you have this nice uh, uh, interpretation of these on shell diagrams in terms of per permutations. And, um, and this just pops out for any symmetry, actually, from this formalism. Okay? Actually, uh, the beta answer is a bit clumsy, and it's actually very hard to reconstruct the state. There's a, there's a very powerful method which was uh, invented by Chitra and Dekatrov and Kirchner, um, where you directly, you, you, it's similar to algebraic beta answers, but you get, the, you get the invariance much faster. Um, and it's also based on some kind of young Baxter equation. Here's the graphical interpretation. And then basically, you start from some vacuum, build up the state, which is the amplitude from this curly B's here. Uh, and then you make, uh, then you, uh, with some channel parameters, uh, and then basically um, you get a constraint again. Uh, if, if this should commute with the uh, monodromy, the u's are fixed, and you find exactly this uh, condition v plus should be a permutation of the v minus. Yeah? Uh, in fact, uh, in some uh, recent paper, we and also the Zurich group uh, worked this out, how this really works in general. Chitran did it also only, only for three and four points. So here's this ansatz, a beta-like ansatz. And then you find uh, that these uh, uh, beta-like roots uh, 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 are just uh, uh, give you this condition here. Now, uh, that actually works for any on-shell diagram. You can uh, construct uh, a deformed on-shell diagram of any, of any type. But then for the, the ones corresponding to the top cell, the permutation is particularly simple. It's just a cyclic permutation by, by k. OK, now let's do a very quick example, uh, n equals 4, k equals 2. Um, so then uh, you should now, I, I'm assuming at this point, because I don't have the time, you, you know a bit uh, this formalism, uh, their formalism. So you should resolve this permutation into, uh, into transpositions. And then uh, these on-shell diagrams are related to these transpositions. At the white node, uh, you turn to the left. At the uh, black node, you turn to the right. Uh, and uh, basically, now in this beta-like ansatz, you, for each such uh, transposition, you put one of these curly b's, and that builds up the amplitude okay, by a beta-like ansatz. So there are some di pretty diagrammatics here, which directly turns these beta states, uh, beta-like states, I should say, uh, into these on-shell diagrams. OK. Now, uh, at the same time, if you look at this object here, uh, 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 it's, um, uh, it's a little bit hard to work with. And uh, a very nice formal way to do it is you just exponentiate in this way. And that's very, very nice, because actually then if you write it in this uh, counter sort of Schwinger-like representation, uh, this curly b acts exactly, exactly like a deformed PCFW shift. Yeah? And, uh, uh, actually, Chitra and Alza suggested that this should always be a Hunkel contour, but that actually can be excluded. That's definitely not true. I mean, the, uh, so algebraic, so the message here is algebraically, these things are the correct objects, and you can work with them, but you haven't solved the problem yet of the contour because it's, it's hidden in this spot. It's, it's hi exactly hidden when you go from here to there. Actually, this is as a differential operator, that's a fractional differential operator, which is more like an integral operator. So you need additional information that should come from the physics or some other principle. And I'm proposing to, to, to or we are proposing to use meromorphicity, OK? Uh, anyway, so Hunkel doesn't work. And by the way, again, uh, talking to Andrew Hodges, if you look at this early paper by Penrose, they amazingly, they, he also has this object. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, and, and I'm almost done. 
So then the final comment uh, is, uh, again, we cannot use BCFW. Now, uh, actually, there were some papers um, which, uh, where it was claimed that uh, the whole thing doesn't work for non-MHV amplitudes because if you deform individually the on-shell diagrams and try to add them up again, uh, you, uh, um, it, it, it doesn't fit. I, don't, I cannot explain now what it means doesn't fit, but then it wouldn't fit. If you know how these things come about from this point of view, from, the, from this uh, contra integration, you see about why it doesn't work. Because I told you the residue theorem doesn't work anymore. So you can't, you, you, you just, you don't find this, uh, you don't find this, I mean, doesn't, there, are no, there are no residues, so there's nothing to add up. At the same time, the top cell contains the information about the MHV, and in fact, also it contains loop information. So then the statement is just takes a top cell with a cyclic shift and deform that. And that is the deformed amplitude. The price you pay, you can't immediately, you have to do an integral, okay? But, uh, but, but, but you have a deformed amplitude for any uh, MHV or not, tree level. And of course, since we know that these uh, contour integrals contain higher loop information, uh, it's very likely that you also have some kind of deformed higher loop structure, I mean, uh, loop structure here. Anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm finishing. So uh, we should work out uh, the, the actual func functions which co uh, 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 correspond to this deformed real ampl amplitudes. And as I told you, they are not just rational functions anymore. They are, they are actually real functions. And in fact, there's a, what you can see easily, I don't have time to show you, but it's very easy to see that you get sort of multivariate generalized hypertrometric functions. Yeah. And that's, that, there's a huge literature on this, and, and mathematicians seem to be very interested in this. Uh, so actually, also since the late 19th century up to, to, to today, there's, a, there's uh, anyway, there's a, there's a big story here. And, um, and anyway, I, I believe, uh, uh, given the arguments I presented, that this whole thing should be very relevant to do loop calculations. And then uh, maybe, in fact, we should just, uh, so f um, when I gave this talk last week and uh, two weeks ago in, in, in Paris, and Lance told me, oh, you are deforming uh, Nima's beautiful Grassmannian. <laughs> so, so now, uh, I, I, I mean, that uh, inspires to maybe uh, um, uh, deform the beautiful amplitude hidden of Nima and Yaroslav. So we'll, we'll see. That's it.